record. Okay, we are recording. Zoom to record. No PowerPoint as a crutch. <laughs> okay, today we're going to talk about molecular reconstruction of Sleeping Beauty, a TC1-like transposon from fish and its transposition in human cells. Uh, this is Ivix et al. 1997 cell, and this is work done at my alma mater, St. Paul University of Minnesota. This is a very, very cool paper. Okay, so let's start talking about it. Okay, so what's the main idea? What's the main idea? Well, um, we previously talked about P elements. Okay, and P elements were the transposons in Drosophila and they were quite a big deal because they were very, very useful in the model Drosophila system. But P elements were not a platform technology. So what is a platform technology? Write it in the chat or say something. What's a platform technology? Platform technology, would it be uh, basically a transposable element that can be used on a more broad range of models? Yeah, that's a, not necessarily just a transposable element, but anytime you see like platform technology, what it means is it's like, it's a technology that can be used in many, many, many different systems. So they're talking about this messenger RNA vaccine uh, for the coronavirus as a platform technology. Maybe this is a system that could be used to immunize against many different diseases. That'd be a platform technology. So in our case, with respect to transposable elements, if the transposable element was able to be utilized in like all biological systems, it would be a platform technology. But P elements were not that, they were only really useful within Drosophila melanogaster. Okay, so this was kind of a problem. So these researchers were setting out to sort of like find a way to do transgenesis in vertebrates. Okay, and so if you wanna do transgenesis, in, in any organism, I've talked about this before, one of the first strategies you might do is to hack a transposon. Okay, so they had to find a transposon that was gonna be useful in, verte in, in vertebrates and sort of like hack it so that it could, could function in the systems that they wanted to use it for. Okay, and just for a brief review, transposons, or for those viewing this, not having watched the other lectures, transposons are cut and paste enzymes. So they get made, the tra if, if this is the gene, if this is the T orf, the transposase gets transcribed and translated into a protein, and it usually recognizes and binds to its own gene. And the, usually the binding sites are inverted repeats or IRs recognition sites that flank on the five prime and three prime end of the transposon. And usually the transposase protein will grab it, cut it, move it somewhere else and paste it. Okay, so just quick review on transposons. Um, okay, let's see if I can do this, add a page. Okay. Um, it's pretty easy to, we talked a little bit last lecture on kind of like finding transposons. It's pretty easy to find transposons if you know where to look. Um, so just as an example, here is the, the, a Wolbachia genome. So this is a genome of a symbiotic bacteria that I study. Um, I just pulled this up because I know there's transposons everywhere. And if you just look at this genome, if you see these green spots where they're kind of like striped, these are pseudogenized genes. So pseudogenized genes are, if, if this was like an ORF, if this was an open reading frame and the algorithm was sort of like fake translating this and it discovered that there was like a premature stop code on here, it would flag this as a pseudogene. Okay, so that's actually what you're seeing here. These are pseudogenes. 
And this one says right here, this is IS6 family transposase. This is a pseudogenized transposase. Here's another one right here, IS256-like pseudogenized transposase. And if you literally just scroll through this genome, here's another one, IS6 family transposase. Let's see if we can find some more. Here's another one, a pseudogenized transposase. I'm literally just scrolling. This might be one hypothetical protein. I'd have to translate it to see. Here's another one, IS5 transposase, IS630 transposase. Here's another one, IS256 transposase. Okay, you get the point. The point is what I said before that genomes of organisms are like uh, graveyards of transposons, okay? You see these everywhere in every organism. They are parasitic DNA elements and they tend to pseudogenize and die and just remain as relics or fossils in the genomes. Okay, so it's pretty easy to find these. You'd imagine you just, if you have an organism that you wanna find a transposis and you just get the genome, start looking, you'll find them. Um, okay, so let's do some more terminology. Autonomous, transposable element. What is that? What does it mean that it's, we know what this is. What does autonomous mean? Write it in the chat or speak up. What does it mean that the transposable element is autonomous? Checking the chat, it can cut itself out, yes. So somebody says it can cut itself out. Now, this is, this is to distinguish between, imagine you had a dead transposase and imagine you had an active transposase that is alive, okay? And they each have their inverted repates, okay? An autonomous transposable element means it's self-sufficient, it can transpose itself. So this one would be autonomous. This one would be non-autonomous. It's no longer functional, but this one, it still has the IRs, they're still there. So this one can still move. If this transposase gets made into a protein and it grabs this gene instead, it can move the dead gene, okay? So dead genes, dead transposons can still move, but they're non-autonomous. They can't move themselves, okay? Autonomous transposable elements are like this one, they can move themselves. Okay, so the gist is these group, they wanna find in fish, they wanna find an autonomous transposable element. If I write TE, that's transposable element. Um, a couple more terms to review. HGT, this will be on the test. This is horizontal, gene transfer. So you can imagine from the previous notes, if one of these transposase genes grabs a gene and moves it, okay, if it moves it within the organism, that's just a standard transposition. But there are certain cases where a gene can get grabbed by the transposase and somehow that complex gets put into a new environment. And if that transposon inserts a gene into a new species, so if this is, if this is in species A and it somehow moves to species B, maybe there's a hybridization event where a closely related species mates with a closely related species and there's a hybridization and the transposon jumps in. And then by under certain circumstances, that F1 progeny can pass on its genes, okay? And it would back cross into the species B. That is one case scenario of how a transposon can move. And that would be what would be called a horizontal, moving from species to species, gene transfer event. This could also happen if there was a transposon in a bacteria and the bacteria was a symbiont or an infectious organism and the infectious organism got passed and then somehow the transposable element 
jump skipped to a new species. That would be horizontal gene transfer. Okay, that's review. That will probably be on the test. Um, transposons have life cycles. Okay, they essentially either live or die. Okay, and the way that they live is by persistent jumping persistent horizontal gene transfers keep them alive. If they stop jumping, they essentially get pseudogenized through a process which is called vertical inactivation. Okay. This was in the public, or this was in that paper that we read, um, this term specifically. And I think what this means is imagine you are a transposase T in the chromosome of an organism. And this organism, let's say this is F0, it mates, has babies, F1, F2, F3, Fn, on and on and on and on. Okay. Essentially, what happens over vertical passage of these genes, so from grandmother to mother to daughter, is every time you replicate that DNA, the DNA polymerase has an error rate. And so essentially every time you replicate the DNA, you're firing a shotgun at the genome and you're just gonna get spontaneous mutations. And so after passages, generational passages, eventually this transposon is gonna get hit by a mutation and then it becomes inactive or dead. And then it can no longer jump and it just sits in the germ, the, the, the genome and just continually, continuously gets passage. That would be what's called vertical inactivation. It just sort of like randomly mutates and dies over generational passages. Okay. Um, so if someone was to ask the question, why are there so many? I mean, I just showed you that genome, the Wolbachia genome. Why are there so many broken transposons? Why are there so many? Um, the first reason is that natural selection on the host, okay? So this is like the fish or the organism that's carrying the transposon. Natural selection on the host wants them gone. It favors deletion, or vertical inactivation or pseudogenation, okay? Because the host does not want randomly jumping genes that aren't contributing to its fitness jumping around in its genome. It does not want that to happen, okay? So natural selection, you will be more fit if you don't have transposons jumping around in your genome. So it's gonna favor their deletion. So this is one reason why there's so many broken transposons because natural selection favors them to be broken in the host, okay? But this gets complex, okay? And this gets into selfish gene theory. The transposon is itself a gene. It's its, it's, 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 its own selfish entity, okay? And natural selection on the transposon favors its jumping. So you have to understand that there's different levels of selection here, okay? On the host, from the host perspective, it wants them gone. But from the transposon's perspective, it wants to keep jumping. So there's kind of like a battle here, okay? The gist is, what you want to remember is that the gist is most of the transposons that you're going to see in genomes are broken. And it's hard to find an active one that's actively jumping. That's one of the lessons of this paper, okay? The other reasons why there's so many broken ones. Two, they can still move in a non-autonomous state if the IRs are still intact. If the inverted repeats are still intact, they can still move and that can cause situations where they get duplicated. If you have a transposon here, even if it's dead, and if this is a diploid organism where you have a transposon here, 
this one can jump out, pop in here, and now you have one set of chromosome that has two. And if this one gets passed down the line through meiosis, now you can generate more and more and more copies of this transposon, okay? So just by random processes and continual jumping, they're gonna duplicate themselves. Even though the function is cut paste, not copy paste. I hope that's clear. Okay, the third reason why you find a lot of broken transposons, um, that makes no sense. <laughs> There's only two. Okay. How do they break? How do they break? Well, if you have an ORF, the most common thing is if you have, uh, so there's different types of mutations. There's a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. And there's also essentially like little deletions, little deletions of an A or a T or a G or a C, okay? If you have any kind of a deletion of a single base, you're gonna induce a frame shift. And as soon as you induce a frame shift, you will automatically produce a bunch of what are called premature stop codons. So this is one of the key terms, premature stop codons. Reading, reading DNA code out of frame will always yield premature stop codons. So if you get a situation where a single base gets deleted, you get that. Most of the transposons have that happen to them. They'll get a single base pair deleted, and now all of a sudden they have a frame shift and a premature stop codon, okay? You can also get a stop codon from a SNP if imagine you had a TAT and instead it mutated to TAA or TAG. This would cause a premature stop codon. So via, via these two mechanisms, they're always generating premature stop codons and then the database annotates them like this as pseudogenes. That's how it happens. Okay. So as a controversial side note, um, and I guess sort of a, since this is kind of a fun lecture, uh, this is kind of one of the evidences against intelligent design, if you're thinking of evolution versus intelligent design, and I'm not going to get into the giant debate here, but there's a quote, there's a funny quote from Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche was a scholar of Greek literature. He was very, very good at Greek reading it and writing it, and he had some comment that if God wrote the Bible, he was pretty bad at Greek, and that sort of that analogy is actually kind of similar to this transposable element um, argument for evolution versus intelligent design. The argument goes like this. If, if there was a designer designing the chromosomes and like saying, okay, I'm going to put A plus B plus C designing these genes. If somebody was designing the genomes, they're pretty bad at writing DNA because essentially their favorite thing is to write in broken transposases. So there's another funny quote by Haldane that, uh, the creator is inordinately fond of beetles because most species, I'll go to the chat in a second, because most species on the planet are beetles. Okay, so there's a funny quote, all mo the creator has inordinate fondness of beetles. And I would say here, a similar thinking is, is here that if the creator is intelligently designing the DNA, he has an inordinate fondness for broken transposases. Uh, it's just kind of a funny thing to think about. That could be true. That could be true. Somebody says, God created transposons so we could use them for biotech. That could be true. Okay. Um, let me continue on. These are just funny side notes. Okay. So proteins have families. Um, if, if we've learned anything from evolution, it's that you can have common ancestor proteins, which give rise through duplication events to paralogs. Okay. And these things diverge and split and have, generate their own families through evolution, okay? So proteins have families and transposons have families. 
And this particular transposon that this group is studying is in the TC1 Mariner family. Okay. You don't need to memorize this for the test, but what you want to know is this idea that proteins have families, transposons have families, and most of the time, paralogs or orthologs within families share similar structural characteristics. Okay. So we'll look at that. We'll look at what this means when we get into the visuals of the paper. So as I said in the beginning, the gist of this paper is if this group of researchers want to find an autonomous transposable element, which it will be useful for biotechnology. Okay. And so there's a question of why pick this one? Why pick this one, which they call and give it the name Sleeping Beauty? Why did they pick this one? Do you guys know? Uh, I think it was based off of phylogenetics. Um, it was. Uh, That's definitely part of it. What's the rationale? What's the rationale there, though? Like, why did they pick this one? So if they take here, here's why. If they take the sleepy, I'm just going to write SB for sleeping beauty up oh, somebody in the chat. Yes, very good. So, so somebody in the chat writes found in multi, it's found in multiple species active. So essentially what they would have done is they would have taken the sleeping beauty FASTA sequence, like okay, the sequence of its amino acids or its nucleotide sequence. They probably would have run a blast against essentially like everything. And the idea is like, we want to find something that is useful in the most systems possible. And they found that the Sleeping Beauty ORF was essentially in many, many, many different organisms. It was, they found it in single cell organisms, they found it in fish, they found it in humans, they found it essentially everywhere. Okay, so this under, this is an important thing that they found that underlies the principle of why this thing might be useful is they found it everywhere. And if you find it everywhere, it's probably likely that it's going to work everywhere. Okay, so that's an important reason of why they picked this one. It was extraordinarily widespread. Okay, so then it comes to this quote is, if you want to essentially figure out a transposable element that will work in your system, you can either find one or you can make one. I like this quote too. This was actually in there. They actually wrote, there are two major strategies to obtain an active transposon system for any organism, find one or make one. I like this quote because this is what Hannibal said, Hannibal conqueror of Rome. Uh, you can either find a way or you can make one. So that's how they approach this. So they first actually just tried finding one. And if you didn't catch this, um, they, didn't, they didn't harp on it, but they cited some previous publications where essentially what they said they did is they cloned out a few transposons, let's say transposon A, B, C, and they tested these out, whether or not they would jump and none worked, okay? None were active. So they tried the find one way, it didn't work. So then their hypothesis or their strategy transverted to, okay, let's make one. Okay. So how do you make one? Then they're faced with the question of, of how do we make an active transposon? Given the, given the problem that most of the transposons that you see are dead transposons, how do you make one? What did they do? You resurrect it from the grave. They do. They resurrect it. But how do they know how to do it? They went through and basically uh, found all those sequences, like the uh, premature uh, stop codons and such, and then isolated uh, Sleeping Beauty and knocked all those out. So you're, you're definitely, nothing that you said is incorrect. Let me try to specify that with a little bit more detail. Yes, good, consensus sequence. So let, let, me, let me follow up on that um, and follow up on the point in the chat about consensus sequence, how you would do this, okay? So the first thing that they did is they found a recent clade 
of fish that this thing had just expanded into. So if you look at evolutionary trees, right, like they look like things like this and things that uh, branched off recently, okay, those are gonna be clades where they might have most recently been invaded by a transposon. And the rationale here is that if they're recently trans, if they're recently invaded by the transposon, the transposon is going to be relatively close to an active state in terms of like acquiring mutations. So they found one of these fish clades that is kind of like a recent extant branch point, which is the salmonids. Okay. And I don't know anything about fish, but I know enough about biology. I can read this stuff. Okay. So salmonids was like a recent clade. They looked in that genome and this is where these TC1 elements had most recently sort of jumped in. They most recently jumped into this clade. Okay. And would, within the salmonids, there were a bunch of different species. Okay. And they sequenced a whole bunch of these sleeping beauty transposable elements from these different species. Okay. And then they would have said, they would have gotten, let's say, let's say they got 10, one, two, three, 10 different variants or sequences. They would have aligned them in the something like the cluster omega program, which I showed you. So they would have aligned them. And Essentially, what they would have been looking for was hopefully most of the sequences are exactly the same. So if you're looking in that program, you'll see little stars where all the residues match. But there might be some cases where this one has a variant here, and this one has a variant here, and this one has a variation here, and this one has a variation here. Now, if you look at the consensus sequence, okay, you know that these are probably mutations because they only occur in say like one out of 10, okay? If they're only occurring in one out of 10 of the sequences, that means it's a mutation. That's like spontaneously like arising. But if you have a sequence that's in nine out of 10, like these stars, whatever these are, let's say this was an A, this one had an A, this one had an A, 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 then that means that A is what we would call the consensus the consensus sequence. So based on aligning many, many, many transposable elements, they came up with a consensus sequence, okay? And then their idea is to reconstruct the active transposon from a consensus sequence. Now keep in mind, none of these, none of these one through 10 are gonna actually be that precise consensus sequence. They're gonna to have to create the consensus sequence by eliminating all the various mutations. And that's where the paper starts, okay? So let's look at figure one and let's look at and analyze what this is. So I'm gonna pull it up here so I can draw on it. Okay, so test, okay. Oh, something in the chat. Can you explain consensus sequence again real quick? Yes, okay. Okay, let me explain consensus sequence. Imagine you have A, 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 T, G, T, 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 T. Imagine you have this, okay? You get, you create an alignment. Now imagine some of these are a little bit different. Okay, so let's say this is this is the first one. Imagine this one starts with a T. Imagine this one has a G. I'm introducing mutations here. I'm introducing literally like literal literal mutations. I'm popping them in. Okay, so we can look at these. And we can see that most of the sequences here in this position are an A. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, five out of six are an A. Therefore, the consensus would be A at that position. And they actually have a term for this. The term that they write is what's called 
majority rule consensus. That literally means they're, they're just looking at the sequence from five prime to three prime, and they're looking at each individual base, and they're calculating the probability at this position of what base it should be. And this one is five out of six are A's. One is a T, therefore the consensus is A. Here at this position, they're all A's. So the consensus is A. Here at this position, there's one mutant that's a T, but five out of six are A's. Therefore, the consensus is A. This one, there's a mutation where it's a C, but the consensus are T. Does that clarify? Okay. So that is mapping a consensus sequence. And that's actually like a really important concept. You're not only going to see this here, but you're going to see this in DNA binding proteins. DNA binding proteins, anything that binds DNA will usually bind some kind of a consensus sequence, okay? So this is a very, very common thing that you're gonna encounter in biotechnology and biology and molecular biology, find, deriving some kind of like a consensus sequence, which is like the, what would you call it? It's like the overall, cons yeah, it's the majority vote kind of at each position, okay. Let's go back to this figure. So here they're drawing out for you. Can you mute the classroom unless you want to say something? There we go. Thank you. Okay. So here they're drawing out for you the structure of Sleeping Beauty. It's from here. Here's five prime. Here's three prime. Here's an inverted repeat. Here's an inverted repeat. And you'll notice, like I said, this one is going in one direction and here on this end, it's going in the other direction. So you wouldn't by eye be able to see this, okay? You'd have to blast this region against this to find that reverse complement to see this. Now, a couple other things we're pointing out, NLS. NLS, hopefully you guys know this now, is nuclear localization signal. Why does it make sense that you would find a nuclear localization signal in a eukaryotic transposon? because it's manipulating the DNA, DNA is in the nucleus, and it's never gonna be able to jump if it doesn't have a nuclear localization signal, okay? So as soon as this thing gets translated, it gets pumped into the nucleus. It's got a DNA recognition sites. These are gonna be the regions that it's binding DNA from. And then it's got what's called the catalytic domain, which we kind of talked about with nucleases. Here you see some charged residues. These charged residues are probably important for the cutting and the pasting functionalities. So these would be the catalytic domain. Okay, so that's what this figure is essentially showing you. Now what they're showing you here in B, okay, this is what you could call an iterative site-directed mutagenesis, okay? So this is the first construct that they started with, Sleeping Beauty 1. So they cloned SB1 into some kind of a plasmid, and the consensus sequence showed that it was different at each one of these black sites from the consensus sequence. So if they want to perfect the enzyme, they have to mutate iteratively every single one of these black sites to the consensus. Okay. So they first start by just restoring the ORF. So what that means is an ORF is an open reading frame. And literally the definition of that means there's no stop codons. Okay. I should say in frame. So what they went, they first went through and they found all the premature stop codons and they fixed all the premature stop codons so that it could produce one single, um, transcript which got translated into one protein transposase. That was the first thing they did. Okay. And at this point in Sleeping Beauty 3, construct 3, the ORF had been restored, meaning it could be transcribed, fully transcribed and translated into a full length protein. Okay. But the activity had not yet been restored. So they continue to iteratively site direct mutagenesis this thing. The next thing they restore is the nuclear localization signal. So they're fixing this piece here. And by Sleeping Beauty 4 construct, 
the NLS activity had been restored. Then they progressively keep mutating constructs, mutating it to the consensus. And at some point, they restore the DNA binding capability, which is probably mutations in this region amongst others. And they keep mutating, mutating until a final construct, SB10, SB10, Sleeping Beauty construct 10, that one is equal to an active transposon. It's completely restored. And it's restored integration activity and they actually measure that. Okay, so that's the gist of figure one. Are there any questions on figure one? That's pretty easy to understand. Okay. So if you didn't catch this, it's worth pointing out. How do they test whether or not the NLS was fixed? So in this figure, they have this little comment that says, restored NLS activity, check. How do they check that? Did you catch that? Did they use uh, GFP? No, they don't. And they actually don't do it in this paper, okay? So they actually did it in a previous paper and they're citing their previous paper. So essentially what they do is, you're close though, they fuse it, they fuse the, they, they cut out, they clone out that little NLS sequence. So if you were to look at this, here's the NLS. They would have made it, they made a little clone that perhaps spanned this region, the NLS region, okay? And they fuse that, let's call this the SB NLS. They fuse that NLS to LACZ. We know what LACZ is. LACZ is beta galactosidase. Beta galactosidase is a marker that produces blue color. And so there's actually a whole nother paper that they cite, which they did prior, where they do this experiment, where they repair the NLS first, they fuse it to LACZ. And what they would probably show in that paper, I didn't read it, but I'm just envisioning, what they probably show in that paper is the nuclei turn blue, which is evidence of LACZ getting into the nucleus. So if you didn't catch that, it's because they're citing that from a previous paper. Um, the moral of this, of me pointing this out, is that most of, so this, this journal cell, this journal cell is a very, very prestigious journal. Um, and most of the papers published in there are products of many, many, many years worth of work. Okay, so they, this, is, this, is, this paper is like work stacked on work stacked on work. And when they finally got to the top of the mountain, they published this in Cell but they're citing some of their prior work um, on this system. Okay, back to figure three. Right, this is figure two. This is just the consensus amino acid sequence. There's nothing more to this figure. They're literally just saying you, this is the, this is the consensus. This is the predicted predicted active transposase. That's all this is. Okay, and then figure three. This is where it starts to get interesting. Okay. So the next thing that that needs to be restored, if you look at this, the next thing that needs to be restored after the NLS activity is the DNA binding activity. So this figure is analysis of whether or not they have restored DNA binding capability. Okay, so here they're showing you Sleeping Beauty. Okay, here they're showing you this from here to here. This is a region that they think is the DNA binding region. Okay, so transposons obviously have to bind DNA if they're gonna cut DNA out. That's a key function that needs to happen. So this is the region that they feel is responsible for DNA binding. And to prove this, they clone this region. So they would have designed primers here and here, and they would have put a stop code on here. They clone it into a plasmid, fusing it to a six histidine tag, his six tag, which is gonna allow them to purify the protein. They put it in a pet vector, which is an IPTG, inducible on lac operator promoter system. So they're just expressing this in this plasmid. 
this little chunk by adding IPTG. Here they're showing you what happens when they express the protein, okay? Here is where they add IPTG, this is minus IPTG. And you can see here, this protein right here in SDS page, which is this chunk being transcribed and translated is made when they add IPTG and then they can purify it on cobalt beads, which means they can purify just this and wash everything else away. That's what they're showing you here. Essentially, the point of this is here's what we cloned, here's what we made, and we can express the protein. That's the gist of part A. Okay. Then part B is starts to get important. Okay. This is a really important figure that you want to be able to understand. So let me first just rationalize and explain to you what this experiment is. So this is what's called an EMSA. Or if you want to write it out, this is an electromobility shift assay. Or you'll see this sometimes as gel mobility shift assay. Now, you know everything you need to know to understand this, OK? What they're doing is they're making an agarose gel. Agarose gels separate out DNA based on size, OK? They're putting in DNA into the lanes, and then they are adding protein that they think is going to bind to the DNA. Now, if you have a small piece of DNA and you run it on an agarose gel, let's say it gets to here. If you have that same piece of DNA bound to a protein, it's going to move slower through the pores. That should be obvious because it's a bigger complex. It's no longer just DNA. It's DNA bound to a protein. And if the protein holds tight enough, it'll actually slow down the mobility of the DNA through the gel. And so this is, will produce an upshift, which is why it's called gel mobility shift assay. It's essentially visualize DNA and see if protein X can bind DNA. So the gist of this is of why you would do this is if you want to test if protein X binds DNA, and let's say protein X is this blue circle, you just test plus minus protein X, does it cause any shifts? So it's a very simple concept, what they're doing here, okay? So some of these are kind of like, they're kind of essentially like, First, I, okay, how do I want to explain this? First, just look at this. First, just look at these three. Here, this lane is minus, what do they call this little thing? They call it, it's like, it's this little chunk of Sleeping Beauty. So I'm going to call it Sleeping Beauty Chunk, SBC. Sleeping Beauty Chunk. Minus Sleeping Beauty Chunk. And this is just the control. So without the Sleeping Beauty Chunk, this is how far the DNA runs in the gel. This lane here is plus Sleeping Beauty chunk. If you add the Sleeping Beauty chunk protein, now all of a sudden this new band right here appears. It's an upshift. So you're seeing a gel mobility shift. What do you conclude from that data right here? What's the conclusion? The conclusion. The conclusion is simply that the Sleeping Beauty chunk binds DNA. I hope that's clear. Is that clear? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, this gets a little complex. Essentially, what they're doing is they're demonstrating in these lanes, they're demonstrating that they can push and pull the binding of it, essentially, like by com competition and stuff. It's not super important right here, but it's sort of like adds a little bit of rigor. Here is where they're adding, this is actually what they call the SBC. They call it N123. And I think it's because it was the N terminus to residue 123, which would make sense. Here's the N terminus. This would be residue 123. Okay, so this is the Sleeping Beauty chunk. If they increase the concentration of Sleeping Beauty chunk, they essentially produce more and more and more upshifted bands. 
which means more and more and more of the Sleeping Beauty chunk is binding and slowing down the DNA. And eventually, if you add so much Sleeping Beauty chunk, there isn't even any more free DNA. It's completely gone, and it's all upshifted. Okay, so this is, you need to be able to understand this data and understand what's going on here. Literally, they're just showing you that if you add this protein, you can produce an upshift, which means it's binding DNA. But it's super, it should be pretty easy to understand. Okay. Next figure is really cool. So this is figure four. Okay. And what this is, is what's called a DNA's one footprint, okay? We know what DNA's is. In our lab, we actually added an enzyme called RNA's. The function of RNA's was to digest RNA. So by same logic, what do you think the function of DNA's is? The function of DNA's is to digest DNA. Okay, so a footprint, a DNA is one footprint is imagine, imagine you have a piece of DNA. I'm, I'm always really bad at drawing <laughs> double helix. Imagine you have a piece of DNA and imagine you add DNAs. DNA is one. DNA is one is going to come and it's just going to cut it up. It's just literally going to chew it up into a whole bunch of tiny different parts. Okay. You get that, that makes sense. Now imagine you have a strand of DNA that is bound to the Sleeping Beauty chunk. Now you add, so this is, this, this is test one, negative control. Here's test two, positive control or the test. In this one, you're adding Sleeping Beauty chunk plus you're adding DNAs one. Now what's gonna happen is DNAs one is gonna come and it's gonna chew this up, but it can't chew it up where the DNA is protected by Sleeping Beauty chunk because it's binding the DNA, protecting it. It's actually physically blocking the DNA from the DNAs from getting in there. It can't chew it up. So. This is just gonna produce a bunch of little chunks. This one is gonna produce mostly little chunks, but then some long chunks, okay? So do you see how these are gonna be different? And you can figure out where a protein binds based on this DNA's footprint. So the reason they do this is if you want to figure out where does protein X bind? Where does it bind? You can answer that with the DNA's footprint assay. So let's look at their data. So, looking at my notes here. Lane two, this lane is plus sleeping beauty chunk. Lane three is minus sleeping beauty chunk. And you can just look, you can visually see what's different. You're comparing two and three, and there's a section here that's different. These are, these are essentially like, they're able to kind of like sequence the chunks. And here, this part is different. So what you're actually seeing in this data is you're seeing the physical regions where the sleeping beauty chunks are binding. Okay, and these are the sequences that they are binding to. Okay, and these are, this is the IR, the inverted repeat. So they're showing you where in the inverted repeats, the Sleeping Beauty chunk DNA binding domain, where it binds. Okay, that's the purpose of that figure. Okay, here's another easy figure. We should understand this, figure five. Okay, so what they're doing here, figure five is essentially what you might call like a jumping assay. They're measuring whether or not the transposon can jump. 
what's their actual word for this? They call this, they call this a helper donor assay in the paper. And we can understand that because we've talked a lot about helper plasmids and donor plasmids in the context of transposition into to make transgenic organisms and in the context of the tumor inducing plasmid from agrobacterium. Okay. So the concept, the concept is there's some kind of helper. The helper usually produces the transposase, the T with a promoter. And then there's a donor plasmid, which has some gene X, which is flanked by inverted repeats that the T will recognize. So this one makes the T, the helper makes the transposase, and then the transposase can grab this gene from the donor plasmid, cut it out and paste it somewhere. This creates a situation where things jump. So they can actually measure this. Here's their figure where they're measuring this. Here's their two plasmids. This one is the donor, okay? And we know everything we need to know to understand this. These are inverted repeats. So they have flanked their donor gene X sequence by inverted repeats, which the transposon recognizes. SV40, this is a strong promoter. It's a virus promoter. You just need to know it's essentially like a really strong promoter, okay? Neomycin is their marker. This is a resistance cassette. And it is an antibiotic, but it's an antibiotic that functions in eukaryotes and it can hurt mitochondria. So this neomycin cassette can be used to select for eukaryotic cells that have had this incorporated. Okay, so this is the donor. This is the helper. Here they have a cytomegalovirus promoter. So this is just a promoter that's a strong promoter, okay? And as I showed you before, it's making the Sleeping Beauty transposase. The one this, and this is actually Sleeping Beauty 10, the one that is putatively active. So if they put these two plasmids in a cell through transfection, so they essentially get the cell to take up these two plasmids, the transposase is gonna get made. It's gonna grab the neomycin cassette. It's gonna cut it out and it's gonna paste it onto the cell chromosomes. And the cells will then become resistant to G418, which is gentamicin, which is essentially the toxic component that they're adding that the neomycin resists, okay? It's, it's easy to understand. Um, helper donor, they're popping in a resistance cassette. Simple as that. So now these are the actual data. So what they're showing you are plates. And what you want to know is dark color equals neomycin resistance. So if you see dark, and really the only place you see it is here. If you see dark color, they have become neomycin resistant. That means this gene mobilized and popped in to these cells. So then you have to ask the question, okay, what's the difference between one, two, three, four, five? And they're showing you the difference is these plasmids. Okay. So here they're showing you, this is a negative control. This is sleeping beauty in the wrong direction. Okay. So here's their promoter. They popped it in the wrong direction. It's obviously not going to be making active transposase if the gene is in the wrong direction. Okay. So this is a negative control, nothing should mobilize. Here's Sleeping Beauty 10, which is their repaired Sleeping Beauty transposon in the right direction for the promoter. This is the one where you expect to see it jump if it's active and you do, you see it jump because they're showing you that it's colored, the cells are colored dark based on the staining. Okay, here is Sleeping Beauty 10 in the right direction, but with a deletion of the DDE. And if you remember from the paper, the DDE region was the catalytic domain. So if you delete, if you delete the catalytic domain, this cannot cut and it cannot paste. So this is another negative control 
where they've inactivated the catalytic site and it doesn't jump. Here's Sleeping Beauty 6. And if you actually look back, what is Sleeping Beauty 6? Sleeping Beauty 6 was something in between restoration of the nuclear localization signal, but not yet capable of binding DNA. So this is essentially a construct that cannot bind DNA. It's another negative control and there's no transposition because it's not colored dark, okay? This one, this final one is a little bit different. This plasmid should have an active jumping transposon because it's the same as this one, it's the same. It has an active transposon, but why is there no transposition in number five? Write it in the chat. Why is there no transposition in number five, knowing that it has an active transposon? Either write it in the chat or jump in and say something. Yes, very good. They've destroyed the inverted repeats. So there's one, there's a right side IR, but there's no left side inverted repeat. So the, so the transposon could only grab it here, but it couldn't cut it out because there's no inverted repeat on this side. So in this case, they've destroyed the left side inverted repeat. It's another negative control, okay? Now, the last thing that they do, so they've proven, they've proven a couple things. They've proven that with respect to Sleep and Beauty, they can, re, they can fix its NLS, they can fix its DNA binding. Okay, let's go through why they proved or how they proved each of these things. This one they proved by fusing the NLS to LACZ reporter in a previous paper. The DNA binding capability they proved by electromobility shift assay. Okay. Then they proved that it can transpose. And they proved this by the donor helper plate assay. Okay. And the final thing that they do is they map the sites of insertion. That's the final thing they do. So that's this figure. So this is what's called a Southern blot, okay? And in the lecture notes, I gave you the Wikipedia page for the Southern blot. Essentially, it's just a assay where you can, you take a genome. So imagine you have a whole, whole bunch of DNA and you digest with restriction enzymes which is gonna cut the DNA into little chunks. You run those chunks on a gel. Which is gonna separate them all out according to size. Okay. And then you add a marker probe, which can hybridize with your DNA and essentially like make it shine. So they're showing you all these sites where you're seeing product light up. These are all sites where the transposon popped in. So a couple interesting things that you're gonna note from this is that in different clones, it's popped in different amounts of times. So in clone one, it's integrated twice here and wherever this is. In clone two, it integrated probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 times, probably 11 times. Clone three, it popped in twice. Clone four popped in once. So they're essentially showing you how frequently it pops in, in eight different clones. And then here is essentially, they can take the sequence because they know what the transposable element sequence is, and they can map out where it hit. 
So they're showing you like upstream and downstream sequence in some of these inserts where it popped in. So they can map, they can map the sites of insertion. Okay, that's it. That, that's it. And this is, a, like I said, this is a, a seminal paper on transposons. Um, it's in a really rigorous journal. It's a great paper. It's easy to understand. I would really encourage you to read through and hopefully look at the data, make sure you understand the data. And if you can, if you can understand this paper, that means I've done my job and you're essentially like at graduate level intelligence in terms of molecular biology. So I feel quite proud of myself if you can understand this. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, I will conclude the lecture. Okay, hang on, let me stop the recording.